Before we go any further, I need to introduce a concept that is one of the key concepts that will help us organize our thoughts about living systems and the biochemistry of living systems, and that's polymer chemistry. Now, polymer chemistry is about a pattern that we see in many, many types of organic compounds. The pattern is this. Imagine taking a small molecule, a second small molecule, and linking them together. Then take a third one, link it to the first two, then a fourth one, and then a fifth one, and adding them all together, like this. So each one of these little rectangles, these green rectangles, represents one of these units I'm talking about, and then we have another unit that we come on here and we link it together. That long chain of little pieces that we're putting together is called a polymer. Poly means many, mer, M-E-R, means part. So polymer chemistry are the chemistry of molecules made out of many parts that are linked together in this long chain. Each individual piece in the chain is called a monomer, one, one part. Now when we do this, it doesn't really necessarily matter what this monomer is. The monomer could be any number of different kinds of molecules. We're going to see in a moment that we can do this with amino acids. That's how we make polypeptides. We can also do it with these things called nucleotides to make DNA. We can do it with all kinds of other things and make all kinds of long linear types of chains. But when we do it, there's a pattern that always tends to occur, and that is that Usually on one side, an OH group, an oxygen and a hydrogen. Now again, there should be a line right there connecting these together. We do it, we don't draw the line just to make it condensed. But that OH group will be removed from the monomer. This is connected covalently to the monomer, and it gets removed. A hydrogen that's co covalently connected to the polymer will also get removed, and the hydrogen and the oxygen hydrogen will bond together to form water. And the monomer, when this valence, when that open space is opened up and this one is opened up, they connect there together to form a covalent bond between the polymer and the monomer. That's called dehydration synthesis. And it's called dehydration because we're removing a water molecule out of these other molecules before we connect them together. And so the water is coming out. Dehydration, in this case, means we're dehydrating this molecule, not that we're dehydrating the, the general environment. And we can do this over and over again. Every single time we put a monomer and a monomer and a monomer together, we crank out of water. So think about this for a moment. Here we have a polymer that's one, two, three, four, five, six monomers long. Let's forget about these other ones that haven't been added yet. How many water molecules did we produce to make this polymer of six monomers? Well, every single bond that connects a monomer is going to produce a water, just like this. So that means the water came out here. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So we have six of these together and we produce five waters. 7, we produce 6. 25, we produce 24 waters. 129, we produce 128 waters. If you've started doing the biomolecules lab, that number should be significant. It's something that you've seen before. So this type of chemistry is something that is absolutely central to a lot of our biology. And in fact, in particular, it's central to what is going on with these polymers and these, or sorry, these polypeptides. Here's how we make polypeptides. Remember, I talked about how amino acids were so important. Here's one of our amino acids. Here you'll see the carboxyl group right there. There's the amine group. And again, you notice that both of these amino acids are drawn in their ionized form. So what happens in this case is just like we saw in the previous slide. In this case, two hydrogens are going to come off because this is the ionized form. And just this oxygen is going to come off. And when this oxygen comes off, it leaves an open spot, an open valence on this carbon. And when this comes off, well, one of these protons comes off, gets rid of that negative charge, no problem. But then the next one comes off, and it leaves an open valence on this nitrogen. Remember, nitrogen can form three bonds. And so there'd be one, two, and then three here. The fourth one is just an extra proton on there. Okay, so the two hydrogens and the oxygen come off, and they form water. And that's what this is depicting. This is what's happening before the reaction. This is what we have after the reaction. And this arrow represents the reaction. So I take an amino acid, another amino acid, take two hydrogens off the amine group on the ionized form, take the oxygen off the carboxyl group in the ionized form, that forms water. And then this open valence on the nitrogen and open valence on the carbon come together to form a bond between this amino acid and this amino acid. That bond now is connected, two amino acids together, and that bond is referred to as a peptide bond. The reason it's called a peptide bond is because an alternative name for amino acid is peptide. And so we have two peptides, but we've bonded them together. And now what we have is a molecule that's called a dipeptide because it's got two peptides together. And the peptide bond is bound like this. This is a special bond. This has some very interesting uh, 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 sort of properties. And one of the key properties they're talking about in your book is the fact that 
On the carboxyl group, there's this double bond in oxygen to the carbon, and then this carbon to the nitrogen. But the nitrogen and the oxygen sort of fight for the electrons. And so this double bond kind of goes in part between the carbon and the nitrogen as well as the carbon and the oxygen. And that's just gets into the physical chemistry of what's actually happening here. But what we do then is this, just like we saw in the previous slide. Here we've just added one, two of these monomers together. I can then add a third and a fourth and a fifth and continue on until I make this long chain. Now notice there's a peptide bond, there's a peptide bond, there's a peptide bond. Each one of these things is an amino acid. There's the amine group, there's a carboxyl group. And each one of these then connected together in this long chain then forms the polymer. All of that together forms a polymer. The polymer of peptides is called a polypeptide. It's many peptides bound together. But something interesting happens when you do this. When we make these small like this, when we make a short chain of say 20 or 30 or so, that just stays like a chain and it's what we call a polypeptide. And you'll notice when we do put these together, we always talk about the N-terminus end and the C-terminus end. What that means is notice the amino acids are all facing in the same direction. And on this, in this case, the uh, amine groups are always on the left, and so that makes the amine terminus or N-terminus end. And on this, in this orientation, the carboxyl groups are always to the right, and it's made then to the C-terminal or carboxyl end. Right? When we build amino acids in together and make these, these uh, polypeptide chains, we always build them uh, towards the direction of the carboxyl end. Okay? That becomes important later on. Okay, but like I said, if, the, if it's a reasonably short thing, like 20 or 30 amino acids, um, it stays as, a, as a, just a linear chain and it's a polypeptide. But if we continue to make this, we can make these as long as we want. We can make them hundreds, even thousands of amino acids long. And what you notice something kind of interesting, between about 80 and 100, when you get about 80 and 100 of these amino acids together, then something kind of weird happens. In aqueous solution, that long chain will then fold into a big blob. But it has to be long enough to do that. And again, the, I can't tell you exactly how long it is because it varies by what amino acids are in the actual sequence, but it's around 80 to 100, somewhere in that range. And all of a sudden, it folds into a big blob. The moment it does that, the moment it folds into a big blob, that polypeptide is then called a protein. That's the difference between a polypeptide and a protein. A polypeptide is just a linear chain of amino acids. And it doesn't matter, in, in this case, whether it's folded into a blob or not, it's always a polypeptide. But if it's folded into the blob, then it's a protein, as well as a polypeptide. We can call it both things, that's fine. But if it's not folded into the blob, if it's too short to fold into a blob, it cannot be called a protein, it's not a protein. And again, I can emphasize this again, the proteins are the key. The proteins do everything that your body can actually do. They control everything. Eye color, hair color, height, how smart you are, how, how uh, well you can sing, how well you can hear music, that kind of thing. All that's controlled by proteins. Okay, so here's what I mean by it folding into a blob. Here's an example of an actual protein. And this is a space filling model. What you have here are the electron shells of all of these different amino acids and so forth that are all here. This particular protein is called P10. This is not an artist's sort of idea of what it is. This is based on research. This is actually from a research paper where they were actually giving the structure, finding the structure of this particular protein called P10. This, per this protein is really important in, in uh, suppressing cancer. And you see this thing right here. You see this kind of light salmon colored thing around this blue. That salmon colored piece is not part of the protein. It's something that's bound to the protein. And it's something that we call a ligand or a ligand, you can say either one, it's fine. But this is really common with proteins. Proteins will bind other things, and the things that they bind we call ligands. This particular protein is a chain of 324 amino acids. Okay, so in other words, if we were to build this together, imagine 324 of these individual amino acids all in this big chain. And that's way bigger than we need to get it to fold into a blob. Essentially, every time you get it up to, to 100 or so, it, it'll fold into a blob automatically, as long as it's an aqueous solution. So this one's a good-sized protein. It's 324, and it folded up, folds up into this blob. And when it folds, it folds into a configuration that looks like this. Now, this isn't the only configuration it can fold into, but the point is that the folding is not random. The folding is controlled by what amino acids are where. Remember, some of the amino acids are polar, some are nonpolar, some are ionic. The polar and ionic ones tend to bind together and tend to be to the outside, actually, and they're involved in 
basically being dissolved in the water. The nonpolar ones tend to dissolve in each other, and that folds the protein up into a particular configuration. Now, when I say it's not random, but there are more than one possible foldings that can occur, what I mean is this. There are only a few, typically, you know, four or five sometimes, maybe more, ten different ways it can fold. But every folding pattern has a certain energy to it. And the folding pattern that tends to be most stable is the one that is at the lowest energy state. And that's the one it tends to go into. And you have other proteins in your body that when you make these proteins, fold them into the proper shape. They're called chaperone proteins. We'll talk about them later in the course. But this then is the structure of a protein that we call the tertiary structure. The folding is what we refer to as the tertiary structure. The sequence of amino acids that we have is what we call the primary structure. So the primary structure is just sequence of amino acids. Tertiary structure is the, the functional blob into which it folds. So that's something we're going to talk more about as we get further on into the course. Okay, but again, how big is the typical protein? It's about typically around 200, 250 amino acids. Some of them can be much higher. There's one called titan, which is in muscles. Those proteins are 8,000 amino acids long. And this one's a fairly good size one, 320 amino acids, but most of them are around 200, 250, 300, around that size. But when they get that big, they always fold into a protein. All right, so that's our introduction to the structure of proteins. What I want to do now is try to convince you that proteins really are as important as I say. And there's really no way for me to do that until we really study the details of metabolism, details of how it is that cells function. But there is some evidence that I can present to you right now that might uh, push you in that direction. Uh, in that particular conclusion. What I want to do is look at what your body is made out of, the types of molecules out of which your body is made without the water. Let's get rid of all the water. And so what we're left with is what's called dry mass. All the stuff that's not water in your body, what kinds of molecules are there? That's what this pie chart is showing. And this big, huge slice here, which is more than half, more than half of this is protein. So if you get rid of all the water in your body, more than half of the remaining mass is protein. So the proteins are doing a lot of stuff. They're really, really important here. So in terms of total dry mass getting rid of all the water, 55% of the dry mass of your body is protein. Next is RNA, ribonucleic acid, which we're going to talk about here very shortly. That's the next biggest one. That's a big chunk. Lipids are molecules that do not go into solution in water. We'll study those in the biomolecules lab, but that's the definition of a lipid. That includes fatty acids and all kinds of cholesterols, things like this. Carbohydrates make another big chunk. These metabolites, this is kind of a catch-all term for small organic molecules like amino acids alone, these things called nucleotides, small sugars, things like that. And then the DNA. Now notice the DNA is a small slice. In fact, of all of these, the DNA is the smallest slice. RNA is much bigger. So of all of these things here, then, which one looks to be the most important? Well, it seems to be the proteins because, again, the vast majority of the material that's in your body that's not water is protein. Okay, so that's what you're made out of. But what is it that the proteins do? Well, here's another pie chart that'll give you some sense of it. And we haven't talked about what a lot of these things are yet. We're going to talk about what a lot of these uh, things are later in the course. But if you look at this pie chart, you'll see this big giant piece here, which is slightly less than half is signal transduction. The proteins in your body are involved in signal transduction. What the heck does that mean? Well, in the simplest sense, what it means is this. The cells are talking to each other. This is how important your cell integration is. They work so hard to talk to each other that almost half of all the proteins in your body are associated with cells talking to each other. The next one is nucleotide metabolism, which means building and breaking down these nucleic acids, RNA and DNA. And notice again, RNA is more important than DNA in terms of the total amount of stuff. So that's a lot of what your proteins are doing. They're controlling the DNA and the RNA in your body. Cell growth and maintenance, meaning keeping the cell alive, being able to have it divide and do all that kind of stuff is a relatively small piece. Protein metabolism, that's proteins making other proteins. And then you've got energy metabolism, that's proteins involved in controlling the amount of ATP and so forth that you produce. Immune response, transport, this is taking things to and from across the membranes and things like this. And then this other thing, apoptosis, that's programmed cell death. In other words, it's a way in which cells commit suicide. That is what your proteins are doing primarily. There's other little tiny slices in here of things that we're skipping over, but they're too small to really be able to be seen on this pie chart. But that's what you've got. That's essentially 
what it is your proteins are doing. And notice all the stuff that they're doing is the stuff that the cells can do. If the cell is going to make, for example, your hair dark or your skin dark, that's done here under protein metabolism because the stuff that makes your hair and your skin the color that it is, is a protein called melanin. And how much of that protein is made and what variations of that protein are made and how much is deposited in the cells determines your hair and your skin color and your eye color and things like this. So all of that's controlled by proteins. And that's when I say the proteins are what do everything. This is really what I'm getting at. The proteins really are doing essentially everything that occurs inside your body. All right, if that's what they're doing, how do they do that? How do the proteins operate? Well, proteins can operate in a bunch of different ways, but always it comes down to their shape, that tertiary structure that I showed you earlier. The shape really is what determines what the protein can do, primarily because the shape determines what other molecules the protein can bind to. Remember I showed you that ligand in that picture. The shape of the protein determines what things can be a ligand, what it can actually bind to. And one of the most important classes of proteins that exist in all living things are a class of proteins that we call enzymes. And you can see that here. This is we're going back to the astrobiology, uh, limits of organic life and planetary systems, description of life on Earth. We've been through all of these, but notice this one. Metabolism is controlled by enzymes and are inherited through reproduction. So this combines two concepts, metabolism and reproduction, both of which are controlled by these things called enzymes. This is where the protein's importance come in. If we look at this, an enzyme, the definition of an enzyme is a protein that acts as a catalyst. That's the simplest definition that you're ever gonna get out of this class. An enzyme is a protein catalyst. Okay, now what is a catalyst? You've seen already in your chemistry class, I'm assuming that a catalyst is anything that changes the rate of a reaction without being changed or altered permanently by the reaction. Okay, now that's the, that's the standard textbook definition. Sometimes in some textbooks they say it speeds reactions. There are other textbooks that allow it to slow it down as well. But anyway, it modulates either speeds or slows down reactions. But the key is this. The enzyme at the end of the reaction is still there. Or the catalyst, I should say, at the end of the reaction is still there in the same concentration it was before. Now, catalysts can be destroyed. They can be changed. They can actually functionally completely be destroyed during the reaction. But they're catalysts if that reaction then also rebuilds them at the same rate. We're going to see a, re, a, a catalyst that acts exactly like that. It's called fumarate when we talk about the Krebs cycle. These are different. Enzymes are different because they do change, but they don't change in any great way. And again, at the end of the reaction, they go back to where they were before. And here's an example. This is an example of a molecule called hexokinase. And this is one of the uh, uh, enzymes we're going to study later in the course when we study glycolysis. Hexokinase uh, basically controls the first reaction in this series of reactions we call glycolysis. And as a ligand, right there, this green piece here is the ligand that it has that is uh, a particular hexose. It's a six carbon sugar. In this case, it's glucose. Now, notice the shape. The tertiary structure has this kind of groove in the middle, this sort of mouth in the middle of the thing. And that's where the uh, ligand goes and binds. It binds right into that. And then the enzyme kind of closes around it. Now we're going to study what happens when it closes around it later on. But the point is that that's when it closes, that's when it's acting as a catalyst. Now, these other pieces that are highlighted here, you can ignore for right now. This comes, again, out of a research paper that was published in 2000, and they were focused on those particular residues, those particular amino acids right there and their function. But this is a more general issue. We're talking about how it is that the exokinase actually works. So this is what enzymes do. What they do is they then catalyze some reaction. In this particular case, they're catalyzing the reaction of putting a phosphate group on top, uh, on one of the carbons on the sugar. How do they work? How do they do that? We're going to study that later on in detail. That's not our point here. Our point right now is I'm talking about why it is that enzymes are so important. And they're important.